word. I had to slow that down for a second. Good morning, good morning. We'll be reading from Isaiah 26, 1 to 3. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for the walls and the, and the bell works. Open the gates that the righteous nation, which keeps the truth, may enter in. You will keep him in perfect peace, whom mind is, set, is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Justin. You guys can have a seat. <clears throat> His mind, whose mind has stayed on you, you will keep in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on you. Chapter 26 of the book of Isaiah, this is a, a praise to God. There's a lot of dark things in Isaiah. There's a lot of judgments and warnings. Um, but this is one of those praises where Isaiah pauses to praise God for what he's going to do. And he says, you will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. That's the New King James Version. Another version might say, who, who is steadfast. It's the idea of someone holding on to the Lord, no matter what's going on around them. Clinging to him no matter what's coming. When my kids were little and we used to go to the beach, um, I used to walk with them in, with holding their hands. And when they're young, you know, they, they get freaked out easily by the waves coming. And the temptation was when they were scared to pull away from me to run back to shore. But that was a sure way to get smashed by the waves. So it was like, okay, hang on to me. I got you. And, and the Lord invites us as his people, keep your mind, your heart stayed on me, and you'll be in peace. There's a correlation there. Between us being fixed on him and being filled with peace or getting freaked out by what's going on around us and turning away from him, being distracted by the things of this world, jumping into something else to give us safety and security. So that's what we're going to look at today, and we're actually going to kind of go along with that theme for the next few weeks. Um, we're turning a corner now in the, in the book of Isaiah. Uh, and then towards the end of November, we're going to dive into more of an Advent focus, looking at the coming of Jesus and the predictions about the Messiah that Isaiah gives us. Uh, so that's, that's the plan here. I, I just want to pray as we jump into this, this part five of Isaiah. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the men, the women, the children who are in here, uh, the teenagers. Uh, God, I pray that you would speak to us. We all have got different things going on in our lives. There's certainly a lot going on in our world. There are wars. There's uh, uh, an election here. Um, there's also personal tragedy we're walking through. There's difficulties. There's uh, marriages that are hurting. Lord, I pray that you would speak to all of us about what's going on in our hearts today. In your name, amen. Um, what we're going to do today is different than what we've been doing. Instead of really zooming in on a, on a passage, uh, we are going to really stay focused on this. But what I want to do is ask the question, why should they trust God? Why should the people of Judah trust God? That's part one. And then part two is, what does trust look like for them? And then lastly, part three is, what does that mean for you and I? And to do that, I want to go all the way back to chapter 2 and sort of do a survey from chapter 2 of Isaiah up to chapter 26. So it's a lot. If you've got your Bibles and you're going to try to follow along, it might be difficult. You might be able to do it, but it might be difficult. Um, so let's, let's go to the first, first part, first question. Why should they trust God? Why should the people of God the people of, of, of Judah who are in covenant with God, why should they keep their minds stayed on God? What is it about God that they should trust in him? Out of all the gods that the people around them worship, why the God of Israel? And, and I pose that question for you and I. Why should we trust God? Let's think that through. So there's two, there's two things that pop up in, in uh, these chapters that I want to highlight. Number one is that he will redeem and purify Judah. That's a promise that he gives them. If we look at chapter 2, 
it says this, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. Now the people of Judah right now are under judgment. They have walked away from God. We've talked about that, that they are playing religious games. They are not doing justice. There's corruption in the courts. And yet, God is giving a promise here. One day, the nations will flock to Jerusalem. In other words, I am going to reverse what is going on in Judah. I am going to purify my people. There is coming a day when my people will shine. And the nations will come to know the God of Israel. That's a promise for the latter days. Now, that ultimate fulfillment has not yet happened yet. We believe that will happen when Jesus returns a second time. When the the people of Israel as a whole know that Jesus Christ is their Messiah. And sets up a millennial kingdom and the nations flock to her. To know her God. But he continues, many peoples will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Again, there's coming a day when people are going to go to know God there. People of Judah are under judgment, but one day her status will be reversed. She will be purified. She will go through a fire but come out purified. Her eyes will be open to know Jesus. And then lastly, he says, he will judge between the nations, talking about the Messiah, and he will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. It's the idea of world peace. What the people of Judah at this time, in Isaiah's time, would want, it's, it's what every Miss America wants, right? Second only to winning the contest. It's what we in our hearts want. We, we want to be freed from threats. There's coming a day when the weapons of war will be beaten into plowshares. It's the idea of, you know, uh, like our nuclear weapons will be turned into amusement parks or skyscrapers, uh, uh, tools of industry. Because there will be no more need for protection because there will be peace. Jesus will bring this about one day. God is promising through Isaiah to the people of Judah, you are under judgment right now, but one day, one day you're going to be in a place where there will be perfect peace. This statue is outside the UN building in Manhattan. It's a, it's a statue of a guy beating a, a, a sword into a plowshare. And there is an inscription that says, let us beat our swords into plowshares. Now, the UN has not figured out how to keep the world from from war. And they won't. Jesus Christ will bring bring that about. But the idea of us wanting to do our part to bring it about, that's nothing, nothing wrong with that. But the good news here is that God doesn't say Please beat your swords into plowshares. He says there is going to be a day when it will happen. It's a promise. It's not even listed as a command here. It's a promise. One day there will be peace. For the people of Judah and for all the nations of the world. You and I are part of America, right? We're going to be part of that if we're in covenant with God through the Jewish Messiah, through Jesus. If we've trusted in his life, death, and resurrection, we're part of this covenant. So this promise is for us. We're going to be part of this kingdom that God establishes on earth through Jesus when he returns. He will bring that about. And he will purify us in the meantime, completing the work he started in us. So that's one reason why they should trust him. Because he's going to do this work. That's one reason why they should keep their minds stayed on him. Because he's the one who will bring Judah to that place. Now the second reason why they should trust him, I want to point out, is that God shows in this section of Isaiah that he is in charge of all the nations. And if you, if you look at chapters 13 through 27, 
God turns his focus away from Ju talking about Judah. So chapters 1 through 12 are about hope and judgment on Judah. There's, there's this future day, but in the meantime, there's judgment. I'm calling you to repentance. If you don't repent, there's, there's discipline coming. I'm going to use the nations around you to bring about that discipline. And then chapters 13 through 27, God kind of turns, just in case it's like, if you're wondering if I'm going to allow evil nations and governments to get away with things, uh-uh. There's judgment coming on them as well. But ultimately hope for them that they can know the Messiah too. And I want to just zero in on chapter 13 because that's where God talks to Babylon. And Babylon has a prominent role for, for Judah. Um, so let's look at just Isaiah 13, 19 through 21. This will make it more and more sense, I hope. God says this, Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the pride and glory of the Babylonians will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, now this was, Isaiah ministered between 740 and 7, uh, I'm sorry, 740 and like 680 BC. Okay, so roughly 700 BC is when this was written. To the people of Judah, Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the pride and glory of the, the, the Babylonians. What's interesting about that is that at this particular moment, Babylon was not very powerful. She was not the jewel of the kingdoms. It was Assyria. Assyria was the big empire. They were the ones that Judah was, was scared of. Babylon was a little vassal state at this point. Not very powerful at all. So Isaiah is predicting a day when Babylon becomes the crown jewel, and that's going to happen in about 100 years from this point. Babylon spreads out and becomes very, very, very powerful. But Judah, in this moment, isn't scared of Babylon. They're scared of Assyria. That's why they're tempted to uh, run to Egypt and form these alliances. But Isaiah predicts a day when Babylon becomes powerful and and then they're going to come in and they're going to be the ones that actually attack and, and take the people of Judah into exile. They're the real threat. They're the ones who ransack Jerusalem and take the people into exile. So God predicts that day and it happens. Okay, so God's word comes to fruition. But then in 539 BC, a little bit later, Babylon is destroyed. King Cyrus Persia comes in and invades, and they take over, and Babylon falls. So she rises. God uses Babylon to discipline the people of Judah. And then God's like, but I'm not going to let you get, get away with your, your evil intentions. So God brings Babylon down, showing that God is sovereign over the nations of the world. And he continues, she'll never be inhabited or lived in through all generations no nomads will pitch their tents. No shepherds will rest their flocks. But desert creatures will lie there. Jackals will fill their houses. And it, it goes on. But the idea is that this flourishing city of Babylon that spread out as an empire is not going to be flourishing anymore. It's going to be like a desert. Babylon's destroyed. What's interesting is that the, the land, the the Babylon, the city, which is just a little bit south of, of Baghdad, I believe, in Iraq, um, this, this city that was once very prosperous, partly because the Euphrates River flowed through there, right, so watering the land, this city was never rebuilt upon to the degree that it once was. Usually in ancient times, a city gets destroyed, and then you rebuild. You don't go out looking for another piece of land, because you pick this land because it was good land. So you rebuild upon the ruins, and then these cities would become like on hills. But what happened over time was that the Euphrates River ended up turning. And so this piece of well-watered land became a desert. And it was never rebuilt the same to the same degree. Saddam Hussein tried to uh, bring it back to its old glory. And because of conflicts in that region, uh, even the, the, the war in Iraq in 2003, damage was done, never brought it back to its former glory. What's my point? 
God's word comes to fruition. He said this would happen to Babylon, and it did. He used Babylon to discipline the people of Judah, took them to ex- into exile, and then God said, but then now I'm going to take Babylon out. God's in charge of the nations. God's in charge of the kingdoms. And then I would say more personally for you and I, God is in charge of the events of our lives, even the ones that seem really, really scary to us. Even the ones where we might be tempted to think God would never use that particular evil in my life. God uses it all to purify us. But it doesn't win. It doesn't have the final say. God has the final say. God will bring it to a close. Jesus' resurrection is proof that there is a future day when all things will be summed up in him. Even death itself will be put to death. God's in charge of all things. That's the point of that section, chapters 13 through 27. So, uh, that kind of ends part one. Why should, why should our minds be stayed on God? Because he, he promises a future day of restoration for Judah and his covenant people, that's you and I. And number two, because he's in charge of all the nations of the world and all the events of our personal lives. That's number two. But now let's move on to part two. What does this mean to keep our eyes on God? I know I'm covering a lot today. Next week we're going to zero in on particular stories uh, about King Hezekiah. But just want us to see a big wide survey of of Isaiah here. What does it mean to keep their mind stayed on God? What are they to do? Well, there's a couple hints of that in these chapters. All right, so if if we should trust God because he's in charge of the nations and he's got a promise, he's got a plan for Judah and for his people, what does that look like for us as individuals to trust God? Let let me just show a few things here that God says, I want you to trust in me by not trusting in these other things. To use my kids as another example, if one of them was stuck up in a tree and they they were scared to come down and I climbed the tree, hey, sweetie, grab onto me and they were still holding onto the branch, I couldn't bring them down to safety. Hey, you you gotta let go of that branch. So God is pleading with his people, let go of these other branches. Let go, let go, let go and grab onto me. And and I would hope that for some of us here today, today's a day where you let go of some of the branches that you're clinging to in your life. Grab more fully onto him. So let's just look. Number one, stop trusting in superstitions and divinations. We've only covered this topic a few times in in True Life's history, but uh, this forces us to cover it again. Look what it says in chapter 2. They are full of superstitions from the east. They practice divination like the Philistines and embrace pagan customs. He's talking to his people. The people who should be trusting in him are looking at the customs of the cultures around them, and they're going, hmm, I'd like to dabble in that. I'd like to find security in that. And they practice divinations and sorcery and witchcraft and these pagan customs. And this stuff is still in our culture, is it not? It's still floating around and we are still tempted to look to divinations, sorcerers, tarot cards, astrology to give us some sense of comfort and peace. Comfort and peace that we should be looking to the Lord for. I used to work at a bar and... Uh, it was kind of like a fine dining place. It was out in L.A. I was a busboy for part of the night because people would come for a dinner and magic show. Um, and, and the magic was just kind of sleight of hand stuff. It wasn't anything concerning. But then at night, the bar opened up. I became a bouncer at the age of 19, so I couldn't even go in there, but I'm telling other people that they couldn't go in. And there were tarot card readers and palm readers, like psychics, who kind of roamed around and people would sit down and meet with them um, and tell them their future and tell them what was going on in their life and give them, the idea was to give them a sense of security. Now these people, these psychics and tarot card readers, they did not have evil intentions. I was friends with one of them. She lived down the hall from me in my apartment. We drove to work together. We hung out together. She didn't have evil intentions, but she was deceived. Like many people who dabble in that. Sometimes they don't have any power, but sometimes there is real supernatural power behind that. And we get drawn in because there's a hunger in us for supernatural. 
But if it's supernatural that draws us away from the Lord, then we shouldn't be messing with it. I want to quote a guy named um, John Ferrer. He uh, teaches philosophy of religion at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He, said a, a, he, he cites a poll from the Pew Forum. As many as 61% of people, talking about Americans, interweave their religion with belief in psychics, horoscopes, crystal energy, astral projection, and reincarnation. 61%. Now, that's not all Christians. It's not 61% of, Ameri- of, of Christians. But many of those are. They're like, okay, I believe in Jesus, but I want to weave in some of these other things, horoscopes and palm readers, to give me a little bit more security. But if it's security outside of God, that doesn't bring him glory. If it's power that doesn't bring him glory and comes from him, then we shouldn't be messing with it. Because in the end, it will mess with us. Divination is secret knowledge. So whether it's a psychic or somebody promising that they can read our palm and they can read into our lives, it gives us knowledge of the future. It gives us knowledge about our lives that we crave. Spiritism. Contact with ghosts and dead people. Oftentimes we want to contact the dead relative and somebody will promise that. I remember growing up, there were commercials for, you know, you call 1-900-Psychic-Sally. Remember the 900 numbers? We were allowed to call 800 numbers because they were free. But 900, if it would show up on the phone bill and we'd get, we'd get beat. You don't call 900 numbers. I remember that. Psychic Sally was, was offering, hey, you call me. I'll tell you what's going on and maybe put you in touch with a relative that you miss. And it gives a sense of communion with somebody who we miss. Relationship, fellowship. Comfort, but it's temporary because in the end, the devil actually gets a foothold in our lives. What the Bible, the Greek word is topos. It's a room. He gets, he, he gets a little room in our heart, and then he can start to mess with other areas of our lives, drawing us away from the Lord more and more. So, people of Judah were guilty of this, this mingling of faith in Jesus with I'm going to find security, comfort in the superstitions around me. Number two. Let's just move on to number two. Stop trusting in image and beauty. Now the last one, superstitions, I would say don't even dabble with it. Don't even mess with it. Don't think that the Ouija board is something to play around with. But number two here, there's nothing wrong with beauty and what you look like, but look what, look what God says through Isaiah in chapter 3. We're going to just look at a few verses, in ch- verses 16 to 23. Um, <laughs> he says this. We'll come back to that. The Lord says, the women of Zion are haughty, walking along with outstretched necks, flirting with their eyes, strutting along with swaying hips, with ornaments jingling on their ankles. So the women of Judah are haughty or proud. And they're proud because they're just focused on how they look. Remember another thing they were guilty of from a couple weeks ago. Injustice. Not caring about the poor, the needy, the vulnerable around them. So this particular group of women were just focused on how they look. With the ornaments dangling from their bodies and they're walking around with swaying hips. Taking pride in how guys are looking at them. Being flirtatious. Finding their identity in this. An ancient version of mean girls. It's kind of the picture here. That's what they're focused on. Finding their identity and how they look. But God warns them. He says, therefore the Lord will bring sores on the heads of the women of Zion. The Lord will make their scalps bald. Woo. Woo. In that day, the Lord will snatch away their finery, the bangles and headbands and crescent necklaces, the earrings and bracelets and veils, the headdresses and anklets and sashes, the perfume bottles and charms, the signet rings and nose rings, the fine robes and the capes and cloaks, the purses and mirrors and the linen garments and tiaras and shawls. Because the people of Judah, in the end, they don't repent, their hearts are hardened, Um, And they are going to go into exile. All those things are lost. And remember, God's ultimate goal is to purify his people. And when we cling to something, we're like, no, I'm not letting go of it. 
Well, out of love, God is like, well, then I'm going to let this thing dissolve in your hand. It's not going to bring you what you want it to bring you. I'm going to make sure it lets you down so that you come back to me. And so if that's image and beauty that we take pride in, that we focus too much on, that we put too much attention to, God's inviting us today, hey, turn away from that. Now, again, I want to say, you, you know, looking nice, nothing wrong with that. Combing your hair, getting your hair done, getting your nails done, covering up a wrinkle or two, nothing wrong with that. There's a line. And I can't tell you where that line is for you, but there's a line that you cross when it becomes your identity and what you are looking to as your source of security apart from God. I can't tell you what it is. You can talk to people around you and say, hey, what do you think? Do I focus too much on what I look like? Am I focused too much on my lotions and perfumes and earrings and nose rings and anklets? Here's a couple indicators, a couple things to consider. Do you get jealous of what other people look like? And by the way, guys, even though this is speaking to the women of Judah, this can apply to a lot of guys in our day. Do you get jealous of other people's beauty, what they look like? It, it, do you, um, in proportion to what you give to people in need, do you give too much to the things that make you look pretty? Like you're spending on yourself and your image. What is it like in proportion to what you give to those in need? Do you get depressed when a new wrinkle shows up on your face? Hmm? Or a new pimple, teenagers. Can you go to school or work even when you have a bad hair day or a bad acne day? What do you think you have to hide away from people? Those are indicators that maybe it has become too much of a source of identity for you. And again, today's a day to say, you know what? That's a branch I want to let go of. Number three. Stop trusting in wealth and possessions. We're going to go to chapter 5. God says, Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left and you live alone in the land. It's the idea of focusing so much on building up my real estate, building up my land, building up my business at the expense of what God has called me to do. Remember, they're guilty of injustice. They're guilty of corruption. And a lot of folks are just like, eh, I don't really care. I'm just going to focus on me and accumulating more and more land and feeling more and more powerful. They were playing religious games. They were offering sacrifices to God. But what they really cared about, what they really desired, was their stuff, their land, their wealth. Building an empire unto themselves. And the Lord says... Until you live alone in the land, the Lord Almighty has declared in my hearing, surely the great houses will become desolate, the fine mansions left without occupants, a 10-acre vineyard will produce only a bath of wine, a homer of seed will yield only an eighth half of grain. In other words, it's not going to produce what you want it to produce. It's, it's, it's going to crumble in the end if you keep cling, clinging to it as your Lord. They're going to the temple to offer sacrifices, saying, God, God, you're my Lord, offering lip service. But then what they were really worshiping was their stuff and their wealth. And God was calling them to repent. And if they didn't repent, these things would crumble. And in the end, again, their hearts are hardened. They're taken into um, captivity in Babylon. And everything fell apart. So it's, it's an invitation for us as well. Do you focus too much on wealth and the accumulation of stuff? I can't tell you where the line is because, you know, having stuff, anything wrong with it. Having investments, nothing wrong with it. Having investment properties, nothing wrong with it. Is it for God's glory? Is it for his kingdom advancing? Or does it, is it just to make a name for yourself? Do you get jealous of other people's houses? Do you find yourself discontent with what you have? Some people take their money and they are focused on saving it, saving it, saving it, because having a lot of money in their accounts makes them feel secure. 
other people take their money and spend it, spend it, spend it, because having a lot of stuff makes them feel secure. Both extremes can be done for the wrong reasons. Because we find security apart from God in our stuff and our money and our accounts. Something to consider. Um, number four. Almost done. Stop trusting in political alliances. Now, we've covered this. At least two weeks in a row we covered this, so I won't take too much time on this. We hit this. I know some people were like, okay, we get the point. Um, but I'll just take a minute just to reiterate. There is nothing wrong with being engaged in the affairs and the politics of our world. In fact, I would say we're called to as followers of Jesus, to uh, bring his kingdom to bear on our broken planet, to be about justice and righteousness for our neighbors and those across the street, in our towns, in our states, in our counties, in our nation. And policies are part of that. Um, I, I put out a video this past week saying that I have a long paper where I interviewed people about why do you vote the way you do and pressing them. And I said that's available for anybody who, who wants to uh, do a dive into that and look at some of those issues. But the drum that we've been trying to beat in here the last few weeks is that participation too often becomes idolatry in our culture right now. Participation in the politics of our world too often become idolatry. And that's what we've been fighting against. And we have an election on, on Tuesday, and maybe we'll know who wins on Wednesday morning. Maybe it'll be contested for the next year. Um, but if we do know on Wednesday morning, here's my encouragement. Whether or not you really believe Jesus is on the throne is tested when you have to have a conversation with somebody who disagrees with you. And it's tested in how you act with the outcome of the election. If your candidate party wins, are you going to be boastful and proud and rude? 1 Corinthians 13 says, love is not boastful, proud, or rude. So if that's our response an indicator that there's been idolatry in our heart. And if they lose, and what comes out of us is not the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, if that's what comes, if the opposite of that comes out of us, the indicator that the Lord has not been our Lord. So be prepared to praise God no matter what, to thank God, or to, okay, Lord, I'm disappointed, but I'm going to trust you. How you respond is an indicator where that falls, the people of Judah were running to take alliance with G Egypt and other countries out of fear. And God's like, no, I want you to trust me. Don't make these alliances. All right. Lastly, number five, stop trusting in people to make you feel secure. This is just people in general. Going back to chapter two, he says, stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why hold them in esteem? to the people of Judah, stop trusting in humans. What are humans giving you? What do we look to other people to give us? All right, we want to feel accepted. We want to feel like we're somebody. I've, I've quoted Rocky Balboa a few times. I stole this from uh, Pastor Tim Keller in New York. But in part one, Rocky Balboa is lying with Adrian, and he says to her, all I want to do is go the distance. Because then I'll know for the first time in my life that I'm not just another bum from the neighborhood. If I can go the distance, then I'll know that I'm somebody. And we often look to the people in our lives to tell us that we're somebody. To tell us that we're okay. To tell us that we matter. And when that's our source, when other people are our ultimate source... We're prone to anxiety because they're fickle, right? We look up to somebody, they tell us, they validate us, and all of a sudden, they turn on us, or they ghost us, or they're out of our lives, and all of a sudden, we start to feel like, oh, no. Or we text somebody, and they don't get back to us, and then we, oh, no, are they mad at me? Oh, no. You ever feel that way? What did I do? Oh, no. Stop trusting in humans to tell you who you are, to tell you that you're okay, to tell you that you matter. To tell you that there's a purpose. People are going to be fickle. They're going to die. They're going to die. 
their, their life is short, or they're going to move away, or they're going to let you down. Sometimes, sometimes our response to that is to avoid people. Well, I'm, I'm so afraid of rejection and criticism that I'm just going to avoid people. I don't want feedback. Maybe we'll even take the approach of, like, I don't even care what people think. But it's really because we're afraid of them giving us any kind of negative feedback. And maybe some of us need to be more open to that. Instead of taking it so personally, hey, get, you can give me feedback. It's okay. I'll take it to the Lord. And then sometimes we look too much to other people. We need to be around people. We want to make sure we're invited to everything. And we want feedback so that we're getting validated. Either way, we need to be looking to the Lord and going, okay, Lord, am I looking to people to tell me who I am? I've done it with my wife in seasons. Any married people able to relate? Just Frank? Just Frank? It's like, oh, no, she's mad. Why is she mad? And then you get in your head, and then her mood determines my mood. Why? She's a human being. She's going to rise and fall. The Lord is the one who's unchanging. You will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. Whose mind is stayed on you, steadfast, clinging to the Lord. Not looking to superstitions, not looking to wealth and possessions, not looking to image and beauty, not looking to political alliances, not looking to other people, not looking to anything else that we're tempted to look to. We're stayed on him. So I'm going to ask the band to come on up here, and we're going to move on to part three. But I'm going to ask us to stand for this. Part three, what does this mean for you? True Life Church and friends and family of True Life Church. What does this mean for you? just want to take a couple minutes just to reflect. Give us a moment to reflect. We're going to receive communion today. I want us to think about what does communion mean? What does this Old Testament book of Isaiah mean for us who are living after the cross and resurrection of Jesus? Number one, it means we can trust that God will finish the work he started. It's what he promised the people of Judah. I'm going to get you there. I'm going to get you to the end. We are a holy city that the nations are flocking to. It's what he promises for his church. Those of us in covenant with him because we've trusted in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. So when you receive communion today, you're remembering, I'm part of of God's covenant family. He is going to finish the work he started in me. He's going to purify me. He's going to sanctify me. He's going to mold me into the image of Jesus more and more and more, day by day. And he will use all the things of this world, all the events, all the disappointments we're facing to that end. He promises that. Romans 8, 28 and 29 says, he will cause all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what he's going to do. It's his doing. So when you receive communion today, you get to remember, no matter what's going on in my life, God is using this to change me, sanctify me, grow me. Celebrate that. That's good news, isn't it? Number two, know he will use the Babylons of this world to do it. <laughs> the book of Re Revelation talks about Babylon. It actually is referring to um, the Roman Empire as Babylon. And, 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 a, and a future world system, any ungodly system, kingdom of this world that is opposed to the ways of God uh, is referred to as Babylon. Babylon is, is then used as like a figuratively to refer to anything, any world system that's anti-God. But we get to remember that God used Babylon for a purpose in Judah and then he crushed her. And so just remember that anything that you perceive to be evil in your life or wrong in your life or people who have done you wrong, people who have hurt you, God will use all that too for your good. And they will not have the final say. He will vindicate his people. He will bring judgment and all that doesn't belong to his kingdom. 
you can trust that. And then lastly, number three, let go of any false security and move towards him. If anything came to mind, if, if it's wealth that you're too focused on, your portfolio, your image, what you look like, maybe you do dabble in divination and, and superstitions that you need to walk away from. Maybe it's your career. There's all kinds of things that we might be too focused on, too obsessed with, too afraid of losing. There was a time when I preached a message on fear, and it was, it was, it was, I, I was trying to be challenging to us. And then afterwards, I felt like I, I went a little too far. I, I was talking about the fear of man. And then I went to my wife, and I said, do you think I went too far with this and that? She's like, no. And she'll tell me. I was like, yeah. I was like, I feel like people avoided eye contact with me afterwards. And she was like, well, that's your fear of man that you just preached on. It sneaks up on you. And, and, and I was looking for validation in an unhealthy way. Instead of trusting, all right, Lord, you're in charge of the results. All I can do is be faithful. So when you receive communion, remember, he's the one that you can cling to, keep your mind stayed on him, and the result will be peace. And if you're not feeling peace right now, it might be because you're clinging to something else that you need to let go of. You can receive communion at any point that you want while we're singing. There's a table to my right, a table to my left. There's a table in the back. If you are on my left, on this side, towards the back, I would encourage you to use the back table uh, back there. But remember, the body of Jesus, represented by the cracker, was given for us. The, the, the blood of Jesus, represented by the juice, was spilled on the cross for us so that we could come into covenant with him. We trust that that paid for our sins. We're in covenant with him. And all these promises are now ours in Christ. In fact, I would even ask you, Jeff, can you put that last number three back up? Move towards him. Obviously, that, that, that's kind of figurative. Move towards him spiritually. But sometimes... It does mean physical. Like I know when I pray in the morning, sometimes I need to get on my knees as a posture of, okay, I am surrendered to you, Lord. So I just want to invite you today. I know we don't do this much. This might feel weird to you. But if you want, after you receive, grab the elements. If you want to just come down here and worship, since we have a small band, just as a declaration that, Lord, my heart, I'm returning to you. It's yours. I want to fully surrender to you again. I want to let go of these false for forms of security, these branches that I've been holding on to. So if you want to just come down front and worship down here, uh, I want to invite you to, to do that. But let's just pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your, the new covenant in your blood. We don't have to worry uh, about the, the kind of judgment that the people of Judah did because we're under grace. We're filled with your spirit. Anything that happens to us, you're going to use it to purify us, to grow us, to sanctify us. It's for our good. It's for our joy. And Lord, when you invite us to let go of things, it is for our good. We can trust you with that. In your name, amen.